Welcome back. Welcome to the first panel at this international conference, Cultural Landscapes, Preservation Challenges in the 21st Century. It's, I look around the room, it's very exciting to be here with all of you. Um, we're marking these uh, milestones in the history of conservation together, and I think it's a, um, wonderful to be here to have these kind of discussions. And I think these milestones, it's, it's important to acknowledge these. Um, and it was great to see Mechthild um, Rossler's list um, starting at her, her timeline in 62. Because these are events where we can really reflect together on our collective experiences, in this case, on cultural landscapes. And it's really from this kind of reflection and assessment, we can more intentionally look at the future opportunities together in this multidisciplinary field. I'm Nora Mitchell, and I'm um, an associate um, adjunct professor at the University of Vermont. And I'm very pleased because we're one of the co-sponsors for the conference. I want to add my thanks to Rutgers University for convening this event, and particularly to Professor St. Clair Harvey for her leadership in not only the conference, but in building the coalition of co-sponsors and partners that are represented here. And I want to thank all the folks, uh, all of you out there that travel. And I was thinking of all the different landscapes out there in the world <laughs> that have you as um, uh, watching over them. And it's, it's wonderful to, to think of all of our home regions as we, as we think about this um, very global dialogue. I had a chance to take a quick review of the participant list. And um, I know you'll be able to do that at some point soon. And it's quite striking, um, this, uh, the diversity of participation. So I think we have a new constellation here, which um, maybe allows us some um, really remarkable opportunities for working together um, across perhaps other lines and disciplines that we haven't had the chance to before. So I'm anticipating many lively discussions, including uh, it was great to see the first question and answer period that went, um, that was so lively. So we begin this panel. Um, we chose this for the first panel because it's really on the cultural landscape concept. And we're going to consider the evolution of this idea. We're going to examine the impact and how it's been adapted within many cultures. Um, and also looking at the comments not only on this panel, but we're very aware that Many of the other panels, and particularly the one this afternoon, is also going to talk about the landscape concept. So this is going to be an ongoing discussion that cuts through um, the rest of the days together. We'll also explore current trends and challenges. And I think perhaps more importantly, I would um, echo Professor St. Clair in saying that we want to really talk, make sure that we don't um, spend too much time on the past and the present, but we really are focusing on future ideas for initiatives and collaborations that might come out of this. This panel certainly builds directly on Dr. Rossler's keynote and Dr. Persick's comments about the links between biological and cultural diversity. So moving to our panel, we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel. Um, they bring diverse perspectives, lots of different experience in many different places. Some are from international organizations, cultural and natural heritage um, groups, some with national government, some with universities, and others with private practice. I have the privilege of moderating um, this panel and, um, and also to be a friend and colleague with, uh, many with this group. And I know they have very lengthy resumes, but unfortunately, um, we don't have time to go into all of that detail, so I will use very short introductions, but I do encourage you that their uh, more complete biographies are in your program so we can, we have the opportunity to learn a little bit more. Each panel will give a 15 minute presentation and then we'll have a block of time, about 45 minutes at the end, really for dialogue with all of you. So please, um, as we hear each of the speakers be making um, comments and, and writing down questions and thoughts that you have to share. Um, and I'll also encourage the panel to share with each other. So we'll really try to have a dialogue among um, quite a number of people. As um, 
Professor St. Clair mentioned, there are some um, comment boxes too. So if you have a lengthy comment, I would encourage you to share it with us because we are really looking for um, substantive feedback and we won't have time within the, sh the 45 minutes to, um, to have too long a comments. So I encourage you to keep your questions brief but feel free and to add to the blog or to the comment boxes. We'd really appreciate that. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Susan Denier. She is a World Heritage Advisor for ECOMOS, which is the International Council on Monuments and Sites. In this role, she advises UNESCO World Heritage Committee on World Heritage Properties with Cultural Value. She's also worked on a variety of projects in many parts of the world, including Central Asia and the Middle East. So I'd like to welcome Susan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and I'm delighted <coughs> to be here and to have been invited to this extremely important conference. As you've heard from um, Mechtild, um, over the past 20 years, there's been real, really considerable evolution in our thinking and practice on World Heritage cultural landscapes. But this has been taking place alongside much thinking on what we mean by outstanding universal value, how exactly we uh, de define sustainable development, and how we can put in practice things like collaborative management. And at the same time, there's also been an enormous uh, evolution of thinking on historic urban landscapes. But whereas I think in recent years there's been a significant crystallizing of ideas on historic urban landscapes, and we're going to be hearing about this later on in the conference, although the emerging ideas on cultural landscapes have been equally significant, it seems to me, they haven't really been codified in quite the same way. This conference does seem to be the opportunity to do just that, to show how robust a concept cultural landscapes have become, and to try and draw together the strands of thinking that are all out there to define perhaps what we can call a cultural landscape paradigm, some sort of worldview of the potential of cultural landscapes to contribute not only to conservation, <coughs> but to also uh, to broader agendas of identity and sense of place, resilience and sustainability, all ideas that were already mentioned by Mechtild. Now, as you heard from Mechtild, the definition of cultural landscapes within the World Heritage Convention was put in place in 1992. And for the first 10 years or so after the World Heritage definition of cultural landscapes, there was much debate centered on whether or not properties that were put forward for nomination were nominated as cultural landscapes or should they be cultural landscapes or were they perhaps not cultural landscapes? How do we define these things? And if so, what type are they uh, of the three uh, main ones, evolving, fossilized, or associative? And there was also much debate in those 10 years as to whether cultural landscapes were a Western notion quite different from long-standing ideas in, for instance, uh, China and Africa. But I think it's fair to say that in the, 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 the last 10 years, many of these issues um, have to a degree been resolved through the nominations and through the inscriptions that have come forward for, for world heritage. Most, of, most people, I think, would now agree that the world as a whole most of it is a cultural landscape, apart from the purely natural places of which there are only a comparatively few. Although the strength of cultural associations is, of course, much stronger in many parts of the world than in others. <coughs> but I think the second thing is that most cultural landscapes are now acknowledged as a fusion of these three types, evolving, relic, and associative aspects, rather than being, we can't somehow squeeze cultural landscapes into one or the other. But also the notion of cultural landscapes is now seen to apply in most cultures, and particularly through the number of inscriptions that have come forward um, around the world for cultural heritage in all regions. But also 
What uh, the last 10 years has shown as well is that these inscriptions of cultural landscapes are bringing forward new notions of heritage. For instance, we have uh, three put up on the screen here just as examples. Down in the bottom right, the sacred mountain of Suleiman II in Kyrgyzstan. <coughs> and top right, there's the cultural root. And this is a very, uh, uh, quite a new idea, but it's like a linear cultural landscape. And that's the Chibrada de Humahuaca in Argentina. And then we have the West Lake in China, which is a natural landscape that's been improved with picturesque elements. Now, the World Heritage Convention, as an instrument, is <coughs> shaping the identification and recognition of both cultural and natural heritage in, around the world. It is influencing the way heritage is perceived. But on the other hand, it's also being shaped by evolving values that recognize new types of heritage. So we have this very dynamic two-way process of push and pull over influence uh, and the opposite. And this is particularly clear in the development of cultural landscape nominations, which we can see as stretching the boundaries in all directions. Now, in 2002, there was a workshop held in Ferrara on cultural <coughs> landscapes. And one of the things that came out of that was the idea that thematic studies should be carried out on various types of cultural landscapes such as agricultural landscapes, sacred landscapes, the use of water, and so on. And the idea of these studies was to help us identify what's out there, what might come forward as a World Heritage Site, and to understand how we compare sites, undertake comparative analyses. But I would like to suggest that the recent inscriptions that have come forward for World Heritage Sites have shown this compartmentalization as rather too simple because m most cultural landscapes are a complex fusion of all sorts of things, utilitarian, associative, aesthetic, and spiritual attributes. And the world heritage sites that are inscribed are a sort of exceptional combination of this fusion of all these attributes that reflect a particular place in a particular time and the way it has evolved uh, over centuries. Just to give you three examples from the Val d'Orcia, from Bali, and from Nigeria to, to explain I exactly what I mean by this. The Val d'Orcia is an agricultural estate south of Siena, and it was designed and deliberately planned by the Sienese to provide food for the city. But it was also laid out as a model estate in terms of its tenancy agreements, which allowed farmers to invest for the future but it was also created as a beautiful landscape, deliberately. And once created, it was painted by the painters from Siena. And images of Val d'Orcia came to civilize the Renaissance landscapes and had huge influence uh, around Europe on ideas of landscape and so on. So th you cannot say that Val d'Orcia is simply an agricultural landscape. Similarly, the Subak landscapes of Bali in Indonesia, since the 12th century, the terraced landscapes of Bali have been managed by a unique community of farmers called a subak arrangement. And water is managed and distributed by water temples. And this allows water, water from the volcanic lakes at the height of the island to flow equitably through all the terraces right down to the sea. And there's enough water spread out uh, to share between all the farmers. So this is much more than a rice landscape. It's a landscape that reflects a particular cultural uh, community and a particular cultural system at a moment in history. The Osrun Ashogbo sacred grove in, I in Nigeria is a piece of natural landscape on the outskirts of the town of Ashogbo in the Yoruba part of Nigeria. And previously, all such towns in that part of Nigeria had their sacred groves, but this is really the only one that survived. And it has survived because a community of artists took it over and reinforced the sacred nature of the, of the grove by creating enormous sculptures such as the one you see here to try and deflect farmers who were trying to nibble away at it. So the, the, the grove is important 
partly because it's sacred nature of its natural features, but partly because of the communities of artists who over the last 50 years have actually managed to protect and preserve it. Now the World Heritage Convention is a site-based convention. It is properties that are inscribed in the list, not people or ideas. Although outstanding universal value may be linked to ideas such as influence or beauty or rarity or whatever, ultimately what is inscribed on the list is a property or a place where a collection of what we call attributes convey what is agreed to be outstanding universal value. So it's really important to differentiate between value and what actually carries that value in terms of attributes which may be tangible or they may be intangible processes, beliefs, rituals, or whatever. Now, cultural landscapes are about the interaction between people and their environment. So if we're considering what the attributes <coughs> of OUV, or Outstanding Universal Value, are that reflect this interaction, we need to think of three dimensions or strands. First, the people, the communities and societies. Secondly, the environment in which they live and work. But thirdly, the process, processes that link that to the social, cultural, and economic interactions between people and their environment. What are they in very specific terms? And it's absolutely crucial, certainly in, for World Heritage Cultural Landscapes, that the importance of these attributes is absolutely acknowledged in relation to the processes between people and their environment and their relationship to outstanding universal value. So what are the, why are these attributes important? Although the title of this conference is about preservation, I would suggest we're really not preserving cultural landscapes. We're, we're rather, what we're doing in World Heritage Landscapes is sustaining their outstanding universal value. And in order to do that, we need to sustain the attributes that reflect outstanding universal value. And that means, crucially, in many landscapes, sustaining the processes that have created what is of value. And just very briefly <coughs> to give three examples, from Togo, France, and Ethiopia, <coughs> which show that really only if you sustain these processes will you have any hope of, of keeping these landscapes alive. This is the land of the Batamariba in Togo in West Africa. And these family houses are built anew each generation to reflect the place of a family within the society or within the village. And the farming landscape reflects a deep spiritual um, value of nature. Certain places are left because they're uh, uh, nature which mustn't be disturbed. And the traditional buildings and traditional beliefs are both absolutely essential if we're going to have any hope of sustaining the qualities of this landscape which may, meant uh, were, which were the reason they were inscribed on the World Heritage List. This is the Konso area of Ethiopia at the end of the Ethiopian arm of the Great Rift, Rift Valley are these in enormous uh, uh, terraced areas on the Konso Highlands. And these terraces support fields of millet and corn and are part of an intensive, communally organized and very finely balanced agricultural system of water management, which ensures the water seeps from one terrace to another. This only works if the whole community work together to make that landscape terrace system viable. And thirdly, the course from the Cévennes in France, which Mechtil mentioned, and this is one of the first agro-pastoral landscapes to be inscribed on the list, and the hills have been used as grazing for sheep and cattle for the last 800 years, and there is an elaborate system of water management. But there are only 100 farmers if you're going to keep this whole system, keep these tracks which you see on the left, the sort of transhumance tracks that go from village to village and actually pass through the territory as sheep and cattle are moved at different times of year, you have to sustain the farmers and the farming practices. And sort of one of the aims of this um, property 
is actually to increase the number of farmers. So there are very clear lessons from the nominations of the last de uh, past decade that we must sustain traditional processes. But I'd just like to say that having said that, and although we now uh, recognize customary law and traditional management systems within UNESCO, traditional management on its own has not proved to be sufficient in the long term. The pressures from the outside are too great and protective frameworks are needed within which traditional practices can survive. Solomon II was inscribed as a sacred mountain. Sustaining the sacred nature cannot be done purely by the local communities. Traditional management cannot stop cable cars that bring tourists to the stop and immediately dispel the sacred atmosphere <coughs> for which this mountain was inscribed. The Val d'Orcha, which I've already mentioned, was inscribed for communities of farmers which have farmed this, this uh, landscape in a way that's unchanged since it was laid out by Siena 800 years ago. Unfortunately, since inscription, it's become a very desirable place for peop wealthy people from Rome to buy properties. And this is in changing the nature in a most dramatic way of this landscape. I've already mentioned the Subak landscapes of Bali, they are one of the few landscapes where an enormous amount of effort has been put in to try and protect traditional practice, to empower the farmers and to empower the water temples. But this has taken enormous effort from the top of the country right down to the bottom. And they're having to make grants for farmers to encourage them to stay on the land so that the value of farming is more than the value of selling your land to build houses and to support uh, other uh, social and facilities for, and so on and so forth and to ensure that the benefits of tourists filter down to the farmers in order to keep them where they belong on this landscape. Just in time, the governor of Bali realized that what was at stake was the whole culture of Bali that could disappear in a generation if they kept digging boreholes and didn't take other action. Many cultural landscapes are resilient, as Mel Mechtild um, ob observed, because they make the best use of scarce resources. They are also the, a depository of traditional crops and biodiversity, but more than that, they're resilient because they have the ability to deal with change and at the same time continue to develop. And this property of resilience is crucial that we recognize within these landscapes. In Konso area in Ethiopia, when there was a drought several years ago, this was the one part of Ethiopia that didn't suffer from the drought. They were able to adapt uh, their systems and to continue to produce enough crops. And one spectacular example in terms of buildings is from Sichuan in China. The, the great earthquake hit, hit Sichuan in 2008. These towers were more or less at the epicenter on top of the escarpment. They survived, whereas down in the valley, just beneath, there were scenes of absolute devastation, as you can see from the top right in the towns. These towers have been there probably a thousand years and have probably survived many more earthquakes. It is essential that we understand more about these sorts of landscapes. This is on the tentative list in China, by the way. So just as a quick summary, the way forward. We need to raise the profile and the wider value and worth of cultural landscapes to understand and define more clearly the attributes that underpin that value and particularly outstanding universal value and sustain traditional processes with supportive frameworks, as well as recognizing that some of these landscapes are the repositories, repositories of resilient systems with the flexibility to withstand change and make use of scarce resources, which is just the sort of thing we all need at the moment. And we also need to view cultural landscapes as wonderful examples of the integration of the four pillars of sustainable development, economic, ecological, political, and cultural. Thank you.
very much. That was um, a terrific presentation from your experience seeing many cultural landscapes um, come across your desk.